So I would say let's start. Hello everyone and welcome to today's session on best practice for measurement with the Lenster optical biometer. This is our fifth session of our biometry focus months. It's a pre-recorded session and our today's presenter is Carrie Menard. Uh, she's a certified ophthalmic technician, a certified ophthalmic scribe, and also is a registered nurse with a bachelor degree in science. She has been working in, ophthalmolo in ophthalmology for over 13 years, first as an ophthalmic technician and clinical nurse manager, but has since been working as a clinical applications, application specialist for Hugs Right USA for more than four years now. She su supports the Lanster users throughout the entire USA from an application and clinical perspective. She's also a presenter at the JCA HPO and other educational events. Please feel free to ask questions using the F and A functionality of Zoom. The chat is also available in case the F and A functionality won't work for you. We would love to get some questions from the audience later on. A recorded version of this webinar will be available in about two days. With this said, I will start the session now. Thank you so much for the introduction. Hello. I'd like to welcome everyone today for our session on best practice for measurements with the LensStar optical biometer. First, I wanted to begin by identifying the different generations of LensStars. Our first generation of LensStar is what we call a green light LensStar. You'll notice the overall hue to the image on the left has a green shade to it. Where the image on the right, you're able to see the white sclera in the true color of the patient's iris. Both of these versions will provide you with the same measurements, but within my PowerPoint, I'm going to be sharing videos and screenshots from our newer white light units. So I wanted to show you the difference for our older green light users listening in that your pictures on your lens star will look a little bit different. Another difference between our devices is our lens star APS versus LensStar Pro. APS stands for Automatic Positioning System. So this mode acquires the measurements using groundbreaking dynamic eye tracking. The user to user variability between technicians is taken out and this is also allows the technician to be hands-free and assist with eyelid height or keeping the patient's, patient's forehead to the bar during the measurement acquisition. If you do not have the model with the APS feature, then you have a LensStar Pro, which still provides you with the same measurements, only the technician has to do all of the work from the beginning until the end. So let's jump into manual, uh, let's jump into measurement acquisition. So here are measurements taking in our automatic or APS mode. You'll notice that the operator starts with the biometer head defocused or pulled back all the way closest to them in a neutral position. And then they're going to move closer towards the patient until they can start to visualize those 32 keratometry points. And when they start to become crisp or that you notice there is a space between the points, that is when the operator will click the joystick button to go to the, to the fine focus adjustment. When you move closer and you're at the proper working distance away from the eye, the dynamic eye tracking will begin. At this point, the technician is completely hands-free and the lens star will continue to take all five or six measurements depending on what it is programmed to in the settings. In the automatic mode, the fixation control will follow your patient's movement. And when your patient moves too much, the fixation control will pause and move up and follow your patient. And it will continue again when the patient is back in good position or when you follow the patient with your lens star. Notice I do have a yellow triangular caution on this fourth scan, but we're gonna discuss yellow triangular cautions later in this webinar. The next video I'm going to show you will demonstrate measurement mode in our manual acquisition mode. If you have a LensStar Pro, which is a LensStar without the APS feature, this is the only way that you're able to measure. But even in our APS or automatic units, you can still choose to measure in manual mode. Within the measurement acquisition screen, 
If you have an APS unit, there is an icon on the top toolbar that looks like four arrows with gears. If the blue shadow is present, then the lens star will measure an APS. If there is no blue shadow, then you're in manual mode. So let's watch manual mode measurements. So again, the operator is going to start with the biometer head defocused, positioned all the way back closest towards them. And then they start slowly moving forward until they can start to see those 32 circles begin to become crisp. And then they're going to click the joystick button, which brings them into fine focus adjustment. When they move closer forward, you're going to start to see the double parentheses on either side of that visual axis reflection. You want the double parentheses to be clear and in focus, and that there is a space between the parentheses on either side. And this is going to indicate a good distance away from the eye. And the arrows are going to help refine that distance. A smaller arrow on the top tells the operator to move a little bit closer towards the patient. And a larger arrow on the bottom tells the operator to pull back a little bit away from the patient's eye. And they can ignore those arrows when that circle size, that green circle, is nice and small and centered on that visual axis reflection point. Then they'll ask the patient to blink, and then they'll click the joystick button to measure. The progress bar will go around, and there is a flash at 12 o'clock. They'll click again and then continue to do the measurements. Now notice if the technician moves the lens star or the patient repositions themselves during the scan, the lens star will pause and only recontinue those measurements when the lens star is back in good position in front of that patient centered on the visual axis. And then the, the technician will choose to measure five or six times depending on the policy and the practice. So now that we've identified that there are two different ways to measure with your lens star, depending on which model you have, I wanna emphasize the best practice for measurement acquisition in either automatic or manual mode. It's very important to not over-focus or attempt to measure too close to your patient's eye. In both acquisition modes, the operator should start with the biometer head positioned or pulled back all the way closest to them in a neutral position. And then when you start to move in slowly towards the patient, you will begin to see those 32 keratometry points. This is adjusting the gross focus alignment. When you are able to tell that there is a space between the keratometry points and that they begin to become crisp, this is when you pause and click the joystick button to go into the fine focus adjustment. Pausing and clicking the joystick button when the circles begin to become clear ensures that you do not bypass the center of the measuring area and end up too close to your patient's eye. After clicking the joystick button, you will adjust the fine focus by moving slowly closer to that visual axis reflection point until you see a green circle. If you're in measuring in manual mode, the double parenthesis indicator identifies the correct distance away from the eye. You can see you can start the measuring process by pressing the joystick button when the double parentheses are clear and that you can see a space between the parentheses like the image here on the left. If you see the image on the right, you need to pull back away from the patient until you can see the green circle with the double parentheses clear and in focus on each side. Here you're going to start to see the operator start a little bit too close to the patient. The lens star is not all the way back, pulled closest towards the operator in a neutral position. And when they start to focus and when they click the joystick button to go to the fine focus adjustment, the operator then has to determine if they need to move closer or further away from the eye. They move closer and the double parentheses become blurrier so they pull back away from the eye and the green light does track on. 
In summary, if the operator started defocused with the lens star all the way back towards them and then slowly progressed forward until the circles became clear and then click the joystick button to go to find focus, the operator or technician will know the only direction they would need to move is closer towards the patient's eye until you see a green circle. The warning message, potentially bad measurement detected, is a message that iSuite will display. And in this case, the measurement is over-focused or too close to the eye. This can be determined by looking at the A scan graph and seeing that there is no space between the cornea and lens spikes, instead of what we should see, which indicates cornea, lens, and retina spikes. Now, as you know, the lens star is an optical biometer, which uses optical low coherence reflectometry with an 820 superluminescent diode laser, which is projected into the eye, picking up on the reflective surfaces. So if you start this, if you notice in this brief PowerPoint presentation, the first spike in the A scan represents the anterior surface of the cornea, including tear film. <clears throat> the second spike is the posterior cornea. The third is the anterior lens capsule, typically followed by noise from the front of the nucleus, various noise depending on ca upon cataract formation, and then the back of the nucleus, and then the posterior lens capsule. The last two spikes represent the inner limiting membrane and the retinal pigment epithelium. The distance between these gates gives us our various measurements. And it's very important for the operator to realize the normal appearance of an A-scan graph, and specifically the distance between, the spacing between the cornea, the lens, and the retina, and keep an eye on the A-scan graph that is displayed after each measurement is completed. <clears throat> Let's watch this measurement from the start in automatic mode or APS. As you can see, the operator did not start with the lens star defocused away from the patient. They started over-focused or too close to the patient's eye. When they click the joystick button to go into the fine focus, where the lens star finds the visual axis, because of the over-focus initiation of the measurement in the beginning, it confused the APS and the lens star erroneously measures too close to the eye. Fortunately, our iSuite software makes it very easy to recognize this erroneous measurement because you can easily see based on the warning message that's displayed that the image with the image of the A skin shown that there is not enough spacing here between the anatomy. These measurements would simply need to be repeated and as always, it is best to begin focusing all the way back in a neutral position and moving closer towards your patient. If you do happen to see this measurement, this, mes this message while measuring a patient, you should click OK and delete the measurement and then correct the positioning error and remeasure. Here is measurement acquisition in manual mode, and the operator also attempted to measure too close or over-focused. Remember, you want that double parentheses to be in focused and clear. And if you see here, the double parentheses are blurred and there is no spacing in between them. And even though there is a green circle, the over-focused or blurred parentheses indicate that you're too close to the eye. That potentially bad measurement positioning message also appears and shows the operator the display of the A scan. And in this case, you were not seeing the anterior spikes. So the operator clicked OK to delete the measurement and then moved the device away in improper focus from the patient in order to acquire the measurements. So if you have a LensStar Pro or you're measuring in manual mode with the LensStar APS, be sure to pay attention that there, is a, that there is a space between the parentheses on either side and that they are, in, they are clear and in focus, indicating the correct distance away from the eye. <clears throat> we
we've all had those difficult patients with dense cataracts. <clears throat> and we all know that light cannot pass through every material out there. So if you're attempting to measure through a rock, you will most likely need to use sound versus light. However, the LensStar does have a dense cataract mode that will kick in automatically. Remember that the laser has to pass through that dense lens twice. So if there is a lot of disruption, the reflection coming back through that second time will be much weaker. And this indicates to the lens star to kick into the dense cataract mode. And instead of displaying the axial length measurement for the first few scans, the software is actually utilizing an algorithm to create a composite axial length value based on the reflections present. Additional scans performed will continue to build on that composite value. Every A scan is a composite of 16 single scans. And the dense cataract mode uses all scans from every measurement to create a composite result. So a composite axial length shows as one value, but it's truly an average of all of the scans obtained. Here's a video of an eye with, dense, with a dense cataract. I would also like to point out that the technician is measuring in manual mode <clears throat> and they're purposefully aiming off the center off axis so they're aiming in different quadrants instead of aiming perfectly on the visual axis reflection this allows for possibly finding an area that or a spot that is less opaque and when they continue to do so you'll notice at first there are no axial length measurements but then a highlighted bar is going to populate, which populates or displays the composite axial length measurement. Stability of the ocular surface for keratometry is very important to ensure the accuracy of outcomes. An unstable ocular surface is likely to make the case unreliable. And a one diopter error at the corneal plane is a one diopter error at the spectacle plane. Dr. Warren Hill, a world-renowned ophthalmologist who is best known for his work in helping physicians obtain accurate IOL power calculations, advocates the importance of optimizing the ocular surface with warm compresses, lid scrubs, and frequent use of artificial tears for several weeks prior to biometry measurements. When acquiring measurements with the lens star, it is very important that you are seeing those 32 keratometry points present that they are present and clear. And if the patient has dryness, you can see the points becoming smeared or distorted, like in this video. The keratometry points during these measurements are fluctuating and some are disappearing throughout each measurement. And notice the patient is not blinking which is also factoring into the dry ocular surface. And at the end of the measurements, the fourth scan ends up being highlighted in pink or red. And that indicates that there are too many outliers in that one measurement or that your outliers are too extreme. So if your measurements result in a pink or red scan, we recommend that you right click on that measurement, select delete, and then remeasure. So let's review the standard deviations on this set of measurements that have not yet had that red or pink scan deleted. Notice the standard deviations for the Ks or the flat and steep meridians are 0 .0 0 0.374 and 0 0.724. The recommendations for the standard deviations for keratometry measurements is to be less than 0.25. By deleting the first scan that is highlighted in pink, where that average K is a diopter flatter than the other scans, and then remeasure that I, it should help reduce these standard deviations if that repeated measurement is closer to the remaining four measurements. So I wanna emphasize a simple but important thing during measurement acquisition. It's okay for your patients to blink. Allowing your patient to blink as needed during the measurement acquisition 
or advising them to blink when you are seeing the keratometry points become smeared or distorted is going to improve the ocular surface and rehydrate the cornea, leading to more consistent keratometry measurements. The patient can blink even when that measurement progress circle is going around. <coughs> We do recommend or encourage you to have your patient hold wide for the flash. And that flash is going to occur when that progress circle gets to be about 12 o'clock, like on an analog or digital clock. During this measurement, the patient is blinking as needed and they're holding for the flash. There is a yellow triangular caution on the third measurement. And a triangular caution is going to appear next to the average K when the patient blinked during the measurement or the lid was, eye, was limiting the number of data points. But you do not necessarily need to delete these measurements with these yellow cautions and remeasure. Instead, you should be reviewing the standard deviations listed below. And even if the standard deviations are high, you can adjust them on the results overview screen. Our iSuite software allows you to look back on the keratometry measurements and review the ocular surface after the measurements were completed. So the technician can click or, any, or anyone can click into the keratometry display, which will open up the images of the cornea at the time of the measurement. In this display, take note that for each scan, there is a potential of 32 keratometry reflective data points imaged four times with a potential of 640 data points over the course of five scans, which is then use, utilized to calculate an overall average. Triangular cautions will appear when there are not enough keratometry reflective points. Therefore, a triangular caution will appear next to an individual scan when the patient blinked or again, um, anything limiting the number of data points. So if you notice on the scan, the patient blinked a couple of times during the pictures, and that was that's because there are only two good images remaining in the pictures, so the measurement is cautioned. However, if you, to, if you take note of the two images remaining, they have a bright reflection point in the center, and all 32 keratometry points are present, which reflects a in a, in an adequate, a very adequate tear film. So in this case, you would not need to delete that yellow triangular caution measurement. There would be no need to delete and rescan because looking at the standard deviations listed below, they're all less than the recommendation of less than 0.25 for the K1 and K2. However, if your keratometry images are missing points in all displays, that is grounds to question your scan. And if all the scans appear like this one, then the patient should be rescanned. And a nice option in iSuite is to be able to use the printer icon on the top of this display. And you can print this page to provide to your provider or your surgeon. And they may decide to treat the patient um, more aggressively with dry eye regiment before biometry. If during the measurements, the patient has an eyelid or eyelash limiting the number of data points available, the lens star will be unable to acquire accurate keratometry measurements. The technician should be instructing the patient to open wide. And if the patient is unable to open wide enough, on their own in order for you to visualize those 32 keratometry points, the technician may need to assist the patient with lifting the eyelid carefully, but be careful not to induce any pressure on the eye itself and only use the excess skin on the supraorbital ridge under the brow bone. Be cognizant of the ocular surface and that holding that upper lid may cause dryness. So allow your patient to blink as needed or if the ocular surface, based on the images, indicates that there are dryness from the keratometry points being smeared or distorted, you can tell your patient to blink and let go of the lid and then re-pick back up. A 
Occasionally, you may see cautions next to your axial length, like this image here on the second and third measurements on the left eye. While I play the video of measurement acquisition, pay attention to the A-scan display that shows after each measurement completion. The patient does have a denser PSC cataract, which is decreasing the signal strength of the posterior lens spikes, which can be, which can be seen in the A-scan display. But even though we have cautions on a couple of the measurements individually, at the end of the measurements, there are no cautions displayed on the measurement average in the standard deviation display on the bottom of the screen. So the technician can click finish and proceed to the results overview screen to further review the data. The A-scan display tells the technician a lot about the eye that they're measuring. When we're watching these measurements acquired here, notice that the lens spikes are very close together and symmetrical. This is a pseudophagic eye, meaning that they've had cataract surgery or they, and that they have an intraocular lens or IOL in the eye. The technician did not change the measurement mode from phacic to pseudophagic or IOL, so there are cautions next to the axial length measurements due to the fact that the aqueous depth and lens, lens thickness measurements are not average measurements for a phacic eye. Whereas if they were measured in the pseudophagic mode, there would not be cautions displayed on those axial lengths. But even if you accidentally obtain the measurements in a phacic mode measurement for an actual pseudophagic eye, you can change the settings for the measurements after the measurements have been completed and saved. In this video, you'll see the operator double clicking on the biometer or lens star icon under the examinations. And this will open the overview screen. And on the top column of each eye, the word phacic is listed. And that was the mode that the measurements were acquired in. If the operator or technician selects phacic, a new display will populate. And on the top toolbar, the word phacic is listed here as well. When the technician clicks that phacic icon, a new display will populate, and you can change from phacic to IOL or pseudophagic. When you click OK and then click OK again, the changes will be made. Thank you very much. Now we would switch over to the Q&A session. I have here several questions from the audience and so we'll go one by one. Um, there's the first one from your experience, what is the best environmental lightning while performing measurements with the Lenster? Which lightning conditions are disturbing either the, the patient or the measurement device? Thank you, Michael. Um, well, so one of the great aspects from the Lenstar of the Lenstar is that you can measure in a dark or light room or lit room. So if the Lenstar is in the same room with other equipment that would require it to be either dark or ambient light, it would not negatively impact the measurements. However, you do have a choice um, in the environmental lighting. So if the room lighting is turned on, there will be less of a contrast difference between the flash of light for the patient that they see if they're in a dark room. So having that light on in the room will kind of help that patient be a little bit more compliant and have a little bit easier measurements for them. Thank you very much. There's another question about, um, in cases of denser cataracts, would you propose to perform more than five consecutive measurements? Yeah, so with the Lenstar, you do have the availability to um, take up to six measurements. So taking an additional measurement after that fifth measurement was taken wouldn't necessarily hurt. Um, however, if you are measuring in manual mode and you're measuring off axis, then you do want to be conscientious that the keratometry measurements 
um, could be have more variability instead of measuring just centrally with the for the case. So definitely make sure you're reviewing your data after the fact to make sure the keratometry standard deviations are nice and low. Thank you very much. Another question from the audience, why iSuite shows so many warning messages? Which, which standard deviation guidelines do you follow? So we do have indicators and warning within iSuite's is our software to ensure accurate measurements. And that's very helpful. You know, other biometers operate on less than superior software. And this is one of the reasons that the LensStar was used to develop the Hill RBF method by Dr. Warren Hill. And I like to think of it that iSuite is so intuitive, it has its own brain to help evaluate the data. So assisting the end user for that best, the best outcomes, especially when patients are expecting spectacle independence is really adventitious that iSuite allows that and provides us that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and actually you, you also asked about standard deviations, right? Yes. So our guidelines is what we follow that Dr. Hill provided to us or recommends. Um, for the keratometry, we would like the standard deviations to be less than 0 0.25 for the flat and steep case. And for the axis, if there is enough astigmatism for the patient to be a candidate for a toric lens, to have the axis standard deviation to be less than 3.5. And for the axial length, we would like it less than 0 0.1. And the iSuite software does allow you to reduce the standard deviation by excluding certain measurements that may have a little bit more variability or outliers. So that's very helpful to be able to do instead of remeasuring your patient or bringing them back to the clinic to, to get some another set of scans. Mm -hmm. Exactly, that answers already the next question. If there are documents available for the validation criteria, this is what you just answered as well. Um, and other question about the standard deviation, is there a possibility to alter the suggested predefined standard deviations you were just speaking about? Yes, so I'm not sure. Hmm. Let me see if I can share iSuite. Let me change my share to show my iSuite software. Mm -hmm. Michael, are you seeing iSuite? Yes, it's working. Okay, great. And let me... So here is an example of a test patient. Um, and for our standard deviations, I'll start with the keratometry here. We want these four values for the flat and steep K standard deviations to be less than 0 0.25. So it might be small or difficult to see, but this one is 0 0.288. So I can click on that value, which opens up the keratometry display. And that standard deviation is in my K2 column. It's listed on the bottom. And I can actually click the arrow next to K2, which will sort this in numeric order. And I can identify an outlier and I can double click it and see how my standard deviation then is with that value excluded. And the nice thing is, is this isn't permanently deleting this. So if I, if that didn't bring it down enough, I can always re-include it and try a different value. Um, and you always have that kind of availability with that. And it does also add an asterisk at the end of the value. So that is a flag to the provider that the data was modified and he or she can always come back to iSuite or use a review station in their office and look at any of this data after the fact. Okay, thank you very much to answer the question. There is a question about, is it okay to use cotton tipped applicator to hold up the list? Yes, so when you are holding up a lid, especially if a patient has um, a lot of ptosis or dermatoclasis, um, you can absolutely use a cotton tip applicator to kind of just lift that lid. Um, you do just wanna be ever so cautious that you're not applying any pressure on the eye itself so that you're not inducing or reducing the astigmatism. But if you use that applicator and you just roll it with the tissue and lift that lid up on the brow, bone of the eye, then that will help um, open the image, so open the eye so that it's wide enough for the lens star to see all 32 keratometry points here during the scan. 
Thank you very much. There's another question in manual mode on the APS machine. Um, lateral movements are challenging. Is there is there a workaround? Do that one more time, Michael. So it basically means if there's lateral movement of the patient, so left to right, um, okay. it's, it's, it's quite challenging to follow the patient if there's a workaround. So in manual mode is, is the question? Manual? Yes, patient. yes, okay. in manual mode. So having your patient, um, you know, positioned properly is going to be great. Uh, it's gonna, you know, in, enhance your outcomes of your measurements and make it a little bit easier. So having your patient with their hands on their laps and not holding the handlebars, keeping their feet flat on the floor, um, having them really in a sturdy chair versus a rolling chair, which can, you know, allow for a little bit more wiggle room um, and keeping their forehead all the way to that bar will really help with keeping your patient centered. Um, there is a little bit of, you know, play with the manual mode that you do have to track and follow that patient. But with good hand positioning on the biometer, that joystick in manual mode will allow you to kind of just do light movements back and forth to follow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. At what point I should ask the patient to stop blinking when measuring? Sometimes patient um, just closes, closes the eyes while measuring. So it's yes. a perfect time point to, to tell the patient to blink. Right, right. So while your patient is, um, while the measurements are occurring, I actually allow my patients to blink even when that circle is going all the way around. And when it gets, when that circle gets to be about 12 o'clock on a clock hand, that's when the flash is going to occur. And that's when you have your patients open wide for that flash. And even during that measurement acquisition going around in a circle, your patient can be blinking. So whether that's blinking as needed, um, but if you notice, I mean, we do have those long blinkers that are just closing their eyes for too long. So you can instruct them to blink a little quicker or quick blink, blink and open, um, try to work on just different terminology that's gonna be working for you. Mm -hmm. What is your experience with squirmy patients? How do you improve measurements? So now that uh, we provide the myopia extension as well, I would be interested uh, for both for young and old patients, which are squirmy. Yeah, no, we definitely get a lot of squirmy patients out there, right? Um, <laughs> in our pediatric population for the myopia lens star. Um, you know, going back to what I was saying before, not in a rolling chair, feet flat on the floor, hands in their laps and not holding the uh, handlebars, which can cause movement themselves. Um, those are going to be ways for your patients to be a little bit more stable in their position. It's always best to make sure your patient is comfortable before you begin the measurements, making sure the lens, the actual table is not too high or too low for your patient. And then if you have the LensStar APS, the automatic one, it can do all of the movements itself, all of the measurements itself, allowing the operator to be hands-free and they can help with a little forehead, uh, keeping that forehead to that bar, or they can help with a little bit of an eyelid opening, um, anything like that. But trying to educate your patients and trying to get those measurements nice, nice and quick, which fortunately the LensStar allows for will help those squirmy patients. Great, thank you. There's another question. How, from your perspective, does the lens that perform with posterior subcapsular cataracts? So, I mean, the lens star, you can't measure through a rock per se with any biometer. Any biometer, you will never get 100% penetration. Um, However, so with that dense PSC, you can try to measure in manual mode a little bit around while still having that green circle. Um, but hopefully in our dense cataract mode, you will still get a composite axial length measurement, um, which is gonna be that yellow highlighted bar that's gonna populate on the top of the measurement screen. So I've, I've certainly measured a fair, you know, a good handful of dense PSC cataracts with the lens star successfully but I've also certainly had quite a few that I've had to either do an A scan or an immersion and then manually enter the data within iSuite. And then you can still obtain your, ax your measurement and your calculations um, if you manually enter the axial length. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. There's another question. What what can account for tight standard deviations on K values with cone on versus cone off scans? I guess they refer to the so T cone. Here. That's kind of talking about our T cone, which is an optional attachment that will go onto the um, lens star head to acquire a central topography measurement. It's a six millimeter topography. Um, so the question was, what can account? Hang on, I'm looking. So with the T-cone, um, you can have a little bit more variability in the keratometry. And I believe that's mostly because the flash occurs a little bit sooner, uh, typically around like six o'clock, let's say. Um, so it's a brighter, longer flash, let's say. So patients are a little bit more squirmy um, or their eye can be a little bit more dry. So having your patient either pre-treated with a dry eye regimen beforehand allowing them to blink before that flash or between the measurements. That's really gonna optimize the ocular surface and then hopefully have better consistent measurements to have those lower standard deviations. Um, but even still, you can tighten up your data after on uh, the keratometry display if you do have standard deviations that are a little high. Mm -hmm. Another question from the audience, how accurate is composite reading during dense when it comes to dense cataracts or when we are in the dense cataract mode? Sure, sure. So, um, you know, it's a it's a very confident measurement. However, you should always still be validating your axial lengths, um, whether that's comparing them between eyes or looking at the measurement itself. Um, so when we're looking at a scan, looking at the um, histogram here, our A scan, we can see a lot of noise and spikes here for the axial length. And this is dense cataract mode or composite because we know it's highlighted in pink or red. Um, so this scan would be something that I've heard Dr. Hill say that maybe he has a little bit less uh, confidence in. Whereas if you have a um, a scan with your retina peaks looking like this that are more close together, like a normal peak of what you would see on a regular eye measurement, this would be something that Dr. Hill would have a little bit more confidence in. So evaluating the histogram, um, evaluating how the axial lengths compare to the fellow eye, and if reason for any difference, whether maybe one eye is a little bit more myopic and longer than the other, um, or if one eye has had surgery, there's a couple of things involved to kind of really validate your axial length. Mm -hmm. If there's any question, always do a backup measurement and just kind of compare with an A scan or immersion. Thank you. Another question, any tips on tightening standard deviation on K readings with low K values? Low K values, um, like flat Ks? I would what? suppose, yeah, that this was, Otherwise, the uh, person who asked this question can redefine the question. But I guess this this is this this should be the question. Oh, little she means if there's little little Thank little you. to non astigmatism, <laughs> should just Thank you for, for confirming that. Yeah. So um, if the patient does not have enough astigmatism, so let's let's look at this side. Our standard deviations that we recommend for the flat and steep case are going to always be recommended to be checked. So the 0.25 standard deviation kind of rule will oblige here. Um, if the patient does have enough astigmatism, so for this instance, this right eye has 1.62 diopters of astigmatism, that is when I would want to look over here to see if this is less than 3.5. Whereas the left eye, the patient only has 0.57 um, for the amount of astigmatism. So this amount of deviation may or may not be necessary for me to reduce. Um, of course, there's a little bit more discussion in, with the uh, with the rule or against the rule of astigmatism and how the posterior cornea works, um, but that's kind of another topic. <laughs> Thank you. So for now, there are no questions anymore. Thank you very much, Kerry, for the yeah, awesome talk and for the discussion afterwards. And with this, I would like to close the session. Thank you all for joining. Thank you everyone for joining today. I hope this was helpful. I'm pretty sure it was. <laughs> I learned a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much everyone.